All right, everyone, uh, we're going to get started. Um, welcome to Retail X Series. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sapna Shah. I'm an angel investor. I'm the founder of Retail X Series. I invest in retail, kind of the future of retail and consumer at Preseed. Um, we have these Retail X events kind of once or twice really maybe twice or three times a month. Uh, this is actually the only event for March, but there are two more events coming in April. Um, if you are on this call, you will actually hear about those via email and um, social. Um, we are gonna have a kind of moderated fireside chat today with time for Q&A at the end. So if you hold your questions, um, you can put them in the chat as we get closer to about um, half an hour in. Um, and, if you are on this call, you will also get an invite to the Retail X Slack community. If you're not already a part of it, um, it's a place where founders can help founders. Um, there are, we've got over 500 founders in the group. Um, so look out for that as well. Um, and then without further ado, um, welcome Camille. Tell us thank a little bit you. about yourself <laughs> and, and, and mouth off. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to tell you uh, about what I've been building um, for the last couple of years. So uh, I'm the founder of Mouth Off. Um, and uh, my, a little bit about my background to start, I come uh, from the CPG space. Um, it's also a space I love. Um, I have over 10 years of experience um, in consumer products. And after my MBA, uh, which I did at Columbia, uh, I went into traditional brand management. So I've worked at companies like Dannon, where I oversaw their portfolio, portfolio and then I was at L'Oreal. Um, and I also launched um, a previous brand, uh, which I bootstrapped called All Beauty. Um, and then I also did innovation and brand consulting. So all of these experiences have really brought me um, and gotten me ready for uh, the journey that I've been on um, and launching Mouth Off uh, today. Great. So let's start at the beginning. First, tell us exactly when you launched and, and then we'll kind of go backwards to say, okay, how long was it? What, was it that you started working on, on Mouth Off before you launched? Yep, uh, we launched a month and a half ago. So as you can imagine, this is a really exciting time. We've been seeing sales come in. Um, you know, our first customer reviews um, have been uh, going live online and we're also starting to see our first reorders um, come in as well. So a uh, really exciting time. Um, and then I've been working on uh, Mouth Off for over two years. So it's definitely been, um, you know, a long uh, journey full of uh, difficulty and excitement. <laughs> and um, just to give you uh, kind of the little blurb or speech or pitch, you know, on, on the brand, um, Mouth Off is the first and only dissolving gum that's actually able to eliminate bad breath for four hours versus just temporarily hiding it like all the other products do on the market today. So while the other products are only able to introduce a flavor into your mouth that kind of tricks you into thinking that that bad breath is gone, but a few minutes later, you know, the flavor fades away and you realize that it's still there. We have a formula that's activated as you start to chew and it binds to, deactivates and cleans away the cause or source of the odor, uh, which are bad breath molecules, also known as sulfur compounds. Um, the formula also dissolves as you chew, so it's gone in under 60 seconds um, because that's all the time we need to get the job done. And it also means it's convenient. You don't need to spit it out. Um, and it's also eco-friendly. Gum is actually one of the top sources of litter on our streets. Just look at those black dots um, that you're walking on <laughs> on the sidewalk. Um, and finally, I'll also say the formula is uh, all plant-based, sugar-free, no artificial sweeteners or colors. Um, or flavors um, and no plastic in it. Amazing. So I can see now why it took two years between sort of conceptualizing and, and launching because unlike, you know, building a widget, um, this, this, there's clearly like some science that has gone into um, the development of your product. Yeah, a hundred percent. You know, we chose not to white label uh, an existing product and just build a brand around it. Um, that's definitely uh, an option and certain brands choose to do that. Uh, we really saw an opportunity and um, you know, wanted to, uh, first of all, solve uh, for a problem that we saw that existed and reached a significant number of people, which is bad breath. Um, and then we wanted to improve on the format um, to enable to solve for that. Um, 
the story started because I had actually learned um, of an active ingredient that had superior efficacy in terms of removing bad breath that hadn't yet been commercialized. Um, and when I saw all of the research and the claims that we could put around it, I got really excited. Um, and I ended up pitching um, this ingredient supplier, uh, a joint partnership um, and an exclusive um, agreement was uh, made and signed uh, following that. Um, and the vision for Mouth Off uh, was really to kind of capture all of the occasions and instances throughout the day that happened from the moment that you leave your bathroom after brushing your teeth in the morning, all the way to when you brush your teeth at night before you go to bed. Um, so, you know, that required a format that um, was portable, that was discreet, easy and light to carry, um, you know, and we wanted something that was familiar um, to consumers. Uh, so that was kind of the, the inception of the concept and of the idea. Uh, and I went and hired some food engineers um, to help me create and formulate with this ingredient that had never been used before. Uh, and then realized and learned that uh, traditional gum uh, has a lot of undesirable uh, ingredients to it, uh, including sugar, uh, artificial sweeteners, um, plastic, animal product. Uh, and so for me, it not only became about bringing uh, this superior efficacy to consumer, but making sure that we were delivering it in a format that was um, made for today's consumer. When you look at the category, there just hadn't been any true innovation um, in decades in the category. So we're really excited um, to be uh, also innovating and updating the format. Um, and just to add one additional thing, we actually needed it to be gum or some type of gum because our active ingredient um, you know, is actually uh, ignited or, or starts to work through the act of mastication because of the energy and moisture. So that was also kind of within, um, you know, the consideration set of uh, what we chose and how we chose it. Um, but yeah, since this was a product uh, that had never existed or never been made with an ingredient uh, that had never been used, uh, it actually required uh, a lot of R&D and a lot of trial and error to make sure that we got the chew correctly, that it tasted good. <laughs> Um, and, um, and that was only actually the first challenge. Um, the second challenge was being able to find a contract manufacturer uh, to actually make the product for us. Uh, we, uh, again, having this be a completely new product that hadn't been made before, uh, it was very difficult to find anyone who would be able to make it, uh, either because um, they didn't have the proper equipment required, which would have, um, required then a capital investment uh, from us. Or, you know, we were doing all this as COVID hit. Um, and so supply chains, um, you know, and, 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 and partners got uh, significantly impacted, uh, you know, across the board and were operating, uh, you know, reduced uh, either hours or shifts. And so to even get somebody to take on a startup brand with a new product that they'd never heard of before, uh, knowing that you know from bringing a formula from benchtop to something scalable would require you know some type of investment uh, was also difficult. Um, it took me uh, ten minutes to find someone. So just to give you an idea of of, of the real challenge and difficulty um, that this took. And uh, I'm glad my partner's great right now. You know, we had a pilot and we did our first uh, launch batch. And actually, uh, given how sales are going, I've ordered um, our, our next production run as well. So, uh, so very excited that, that, that those, those pieces came together. But at, at certain point, there was a moment when I actually wasn't sure we were going to be able to launch or have any product uh, in market at all. Well, that sounds like... Um... A journey. <laughs> I mean, I think that, you know, it's not, I would say it's not that it, different in that COVID was clearly a huge component as well. But, you know, I think we, t we talked to a lot of founders who, um, you know, in those early days, it's really hard to find the manufacturing, especially if you're doing something that's just a little off the norm or something a little different, no matter what your category is. So thank you for sharing that story. Okay, so let's talk about kind of, okay, you're working on all, all this manufacturing and stuff on, on the one hand, and you're hoping that it all happens and you're going to have product. But at the same time, you're parallel pathing on 
the branding and understanding who that customer is and kind of thinking through, um, you know, how, how the, what are the key elements of the brand, you know, the voice, all of that stuff. So let's talk a little bit about that branding piece. How did you go about branding mouth off from the, from the beginning? Yeah. So uh, I will uh, say that I have, I'm very privileged that I have a brother who is a graphic designer. Uh, so that helps a lot. And I, you know, I clearly think he's very talented. He'd also helped me with my previous business, All Beauty. Uh, so that, um, you know, component uh, was easy uh, for me. You can definitely find branding agencies or people on Fiverr up or Upwork, really depends on, on your budget. Uh, but I think, you know, as I was uh, conceptualizing uh, the brand, wanted to make sure that uh, it resonated as something different. So, you know, in the name itself, you know, it's called Mouth Off, like <laughs> it was meant to be a little cheeky, uh, fun, um, but we really did not want to play um, either in uh, kind of the candy space where a lot of the current government products are. And at the same time, um, we didn't want to also um, deepen or highlight the stigma that might come um, with, you know, when you think about bad breath. So, you know, imagine pulling out, you know, a pack of mouth off. We didn't want everybody to be like, oh my God, that's the person that has, you know, the halitosis. Um, so really these were all considerations. We wanted to, to think of a brand uh, that was all about empowerment um, giving you the confidence uh, to be yourself. And so that's where the name Mouth Off came from. Um, and, and then of course, you know, I always believe in testing uh, as much as you can with your consumer audience. Um, and so we did a lot of testing. We tested the name, um, we tested the logo, uh, we tested the branding. Uh, we also tested uh, different packaging types. So really uh, try to optimize, um, you know, what our brand would be and look like um, through uh, data and kind of, uh, you know, iterating uh, and improving along the way. Um, I can also say we tested uh, the concept, you know, very early on, we tested direct to consumer, you know, as, as a channel, we tested pricing uh, as well, just to make sure that uh, we were getting as much information as possible to make sure that at least at launch, we had done all we could to ensure um, the most successful launch uh, that we could, though understanding completely that, you know, once you're in market, you continue to learn, um, you know, and have to iterate, adapt, uh, and optimize as well. So when you say you tested all these kind of different elements of the brand, um, were you doing surveys of potential customers? Like, how were you testing um, all of these elements? Yep. So um, I started out before we even had the brand um, by doing uh, customer interviews. So really trying to understand the insights, you know, what uh, influenced, affected them, um, you know, how they thought about bad breath, uh, just to get a, just a basic understanding of the landscape, um, you know, and, and where opportunity might be for us to position and differentiate. And then I ended up actually using um, a partner uh, with whom I was a beta tester uh, to test this. So we were able to upload concepts, um, and then get through, uh, their network, um, you know, an N of usually at least 200, uh, people within our target demographic, uh, to give us that data, um, which was quite helpful, um, because we didn't have to source, um, you know, who, who these people would be, uh, answering, um, our surveys and, you know, really wanted to make sure that it wasn't just, you know, friends and family, because um, as much as, you know, you, you want your friends and family, you know, to be there to support, you know, and be your ambassadors, especially at the beginning and advocates, um, they at times aren't um, an accurate representation um, of your target customer and population. I'm so glad you said that, because I think that is the advice I'm always giving founders, which is that you've gone and done customer, inter customer interviews. Is it like 50 of your closest friends? The Throw those out. Those aren't helpful. <laughs> so um, I'm really glad you said that. So you mentioned that your brother is a graphic designer. So he was um, a key kind of um, 
part in, in helping you brand. Did you also hire um, an agency or other freelancers kind of during this time? I mean, you mentioned that you worked um, with a company to do the surveying, but um, on the branding front, was it really just your brother and you? Yeah, on the branding front, um, it was just my brother and I. Uh, he, he, you know, not only did, um, you know, the branding guidelines, the logo, the packaging, you know, and also developed additional assets, you know, like the insert, you know, that we send um, during, uh, you know, in, in our DTC mailing. We did um, use uh, uh, consultants and contractors, though, for photography, for example, I hired a wonderful woman uh, you know, who did all the photography that you see, you know, so all of our assets on the website and on our social um, were, you know, were photographed by her one day in December with all of us wearing masks. It was quite, quite interesting and difficult, um, given, again, the, the challenges of COVID. Um, I've also uh, been working with a very talented woman uh, who's helped me uh, build the website um, on Shopify, though, so, you know, uh, very much using themes, but uh, optimizing it to what we wanted, uh, as well as uh, making sure that all of the back end works and is plugged in um, properly. And then finally, uh, I'm also working uh, with uh, a very small agency on our um, Facebook and Instagram ads. Great. So I, I want to... I want to talk about the Facebook and Instagram ads, but before we get to that, I want to kind of go back to something you you alluded to pricing. So, you you have a product that does, has comparables, but in different formats, and yours is clearly something very different. Um, you know, it is like a gum, but it's not gum. Um, how did you think through kind of pricing and where you would price this product, um, especially kind of before you? launched and really didn't have any um product to sell yeah no i think that's um that was definitely a very challenging uh component of it uh you know as we were starting off uh i had uh, estimated cogs but uh not final ones you know so was really working with the worst case scenario um at the time mm -hmm. as we were figuring out and optimizing and then i can tell you uh, quick funny story in a second, but what we, what I, the way I, I, I approached it, and I don't know if this is the right way, but how I did is I, I first looked um, at the competitive set. So really needed to understand, um, you know, who was uh, pricing what at where, um, and then looked um, not only at the kind of gum set, uh, you know, for fresh breath, but also uh, took a look at um, functional gum, uh, in general, um, given that we don't consider ourselves to be a candy um, compared, you know, as, as the other gums, uh, you know, would be in and, and where they're merchandised. So looking at functional gums and really understanding, you know, what, uh, you know, price ranges um, do you see there? You know, and, and, and when you look at that, you see that, you know, some of these gums per unit, um, you know, can sell up to $3 um, per piece. Uh, and so, you know, that gave us confidence um, to figure out what our pricing should be and know that if we were priced higher than, you know, um, a 13 cents per piece, uh, we would be able to justify because of the functionality that we offered. Again, well, this was our hypothesis, <laughs> I should say. Um, and so, so that was, you know, the kind of the initial um, just work that I did in terms of, you know, understanding the landscape. And then we started with our COGS, um, you know, and understood uh, what all of our costs would be and uh, what our margins, you know, we're going to need to be for us to be, um, you know, a successful uh, brand and sustainable business uh, that would be able to grow and scale. Um, and we did all that math and, and that's kind of the pricing that you see. And, and based on the functionality that, that we offered um, and some of the initial feedback of just speaking to a variety of different people, as, as you can imagine, as I'm sure all the founders on the call also, you know, uh, do like I'm on the phone, you know, through the network with, um, you know, at, at least, you know, five to 10 people, new people every week. And so, you know, this was, uh, you know, a lot of questions and feedback that I also got people, you know, overall did not uh, have any concern about the at the price. So, you know, that was also an indicator. But I think that um, finally, you know, we launched uh, and are seeing really high conversions on our site. 
So, you know, what this tells me is not only are we solving a real problem, um, you know, with a solution that people want, but that they're willing to pay the price for it. Um, I think, you know, we would be um, reconsidering um, or reassessing our price point if we were seeing, you know, high click throughs and then low conversions, um, you know, because that would be, a, you know, some type of indicator um, to us either that the messaging on the site or that the price on the site um, wasn't aligned with what consumers were expecting. But right now we're seeing, you know, all of that uh, aligning properly. So, so it's pretty exciting. Um, I think that that um, you might be one of the few founders who immediately was like, oh, this pricing is working. <laughs> Maybe the group would go up, actually. But I will tell you that, you know, um, so uh, we had, um, you know, turned on free, like uh, pre-sales just to have the functionality live on our website, um, given that we weren't really sure when we were launching at the beginning because of, you know, all the supply uh, chain and logistics issue that, you know, I, I alluded to. But, uh, you know, I had been asked to uh, talk about, you know, storytelling and, and creating a brand on a podcast back in December and had been interviewed, uh, you know, for a few other opportunities. So definitely wanted to make sure that I had some way of capturing um, any type of interest that came to the site along. But we initially thought we were going to be launching a pack with eight pieces in it, um, sadly, uh, because, you know, the, the packing machine w did not work uh, as anticipated. Uh, we had to switch to a different machine um, and pack 10 pieces instead. So uh, we did have to change our pricing early on and I'm glad that we had um, not really done a big launch because otherwise, uh, you know, that would have clearly, I mean, impacted, um, you know, our, our unit economics at the beginning, which I guess is not like the biggest deal if you're, if you're early on, but, you know, would have been uh, a slight messaging nightmare. So um, it only impacted, you know, about 20 people who just got more products. So hopefully they were happy, <laughs> um, but then quickly, uh, you know, had to change uh, all of the messaging on the site and, you know, the pricing as well. Yeah. It's nice to be able to do that early before. The world knows what your price is um, for sure. Okay, so we talked a lot about kind of the setting up of the launch and you've alluded a little bit to the launch. So obviously you launch during COVID. So, you know, what kind of launch can you really do? And what did you really do? Like, was it kind of a soft launch? Were you, were you planning to do a big and splashy launch? Like what was sort of your original plan maybe and, and, and the plan that you ended up with or maybe they were the same? Yeah, um, so we did a soft launch um, and that was really because we just weren't sure when we were going to have finished packaged product to actually ship, uh, which really limited, um, you know, our, our opportunities um, in terms of, you know, what we could do. So a couple of weeks prior to when we had expected uh, to start shipping, we started turning on um, some Facebook and Instagram advertising. We also started doing um, some uh, Google ads uh, around keywords. Um, and uh, it, was, it was mainly to just get a benchmark um, and, and start to learn to see um, if people, you know, were clicking on the ads, you know, learning what messaging, what creative was working. Uh, we saw that uh, Instagram and Facebook were working uh, really well for us, but that um, Google search was not. Well, it's not that it wasn't, it was just that our cost per acquisition was two to three times the cost that it was on Facebook. So we decided to just halt um, that uh, channel at the beginning. Um, and in terms of, um, you know, additional things that, you know, we, we would have loved to do during launch, I mean, given COVID, uh, sampling and events uh, are really cha challenging uh, to do. But, um, you know, that would have otherwise been something that we would uh, definitely have included um, in our um, launch plan. And, um, but, you know, for example, uh, this, this weekend and week uh, and, and upcoming week, we're going to be part of a consumer facing uh, trade show focused on gluten free products. Um, so we're really trying to find other ways to still get the word out. But I think, you know, nothing really is replacing uh, the actual sampling component, um, you know, when you're an ingestible, uh, which, you know, you would have been able to to do, um, you know, at, at, at products uh, or, or at events, um, you know, during other times. So, so, so we're actually 
thinking um, of other ways to do that. We actually had a dentist um, reach out to us because they saw our social media and um, wanted to know if we could provide um, small sample sizes for them to put in their gift bags and potentially uh, then, you know, sell the full uh, packed product um, in their office, uh, you know, if their customers responded positively. And so that to me is really exciting um, as an opportunity. Uh, you know, we will definitely be um, trying that out and seeing, you know, what conversion is. We, of course, will offer, you know, a coupon code to be able to track, you know, and see, um, you know, if that moves the needle uh, in any way, shape or form. So I think that, um, you know, trying to be, I guess, resourceful and creative because, um, you know, as I'm sure uh, you would also advise me, uh, we don't want to be relying solely uh, on Facebook ads, um, you know, for, uh, for our top of funnel, um, you know, and for, for our acquisition. So, so um, how long was it before you actually had product to ship when you started kind of doing those pre-orders or pre-sales? So we turned on pre-orders in December. Um, but weren't actually promoting or marketing it. It was just there in case somebody came. Um, and then we started turning on um, advertising about two weeks before we anticipated shipping. Um, we ended up being delayed an additional week because uh, there was a very big snowstorm in New York and <laughs> Um, our product was not able to get from uh, our production facility to our 3PL um, in time uh, due to the challenges on the roads. Um, so, but, but just to give you an idea, uh, you know, I've been told, um, you know, by mentors and advisors that you don't want to start um, marketing or advertising too early um, because a lot of those leads that you get um, you know, end up being really hot for only a couple of weeks uh, at most. Uh, and so it ends up, unless you're doing it for purely testing and learning purposes, it ends up being wasted money. Uh, so really, I was trying to be very uh, conscious um, of this. And I will tell you that even if we had the messaging very clear on our website, we had a big banner saying we were shipping, um, you know, in mid-February, the confirmation email that you got uh, said that it was shipping in mid-February, I still started getting, you know, um, customer uh, emails asking uh, why the product hadn't shipped yet. And so, I mean, for me, you know, I, I guess I'm glad we didn't do a big push earlier on because I can only imagine that uh, we would have gotten a lot more of those types of kind of customer service um, emails. Yeah, I think that is really interesting because I do, I've heard that before that um, I don't know that people read the fine print or even the large print on that is like, oh, this sounds great. And I expect everything to be within two days. So, you know, where is it? Um, so did, you mentioned that you um, you were on a podcast in December. Um, did you do any other kind of press leading up to the launch or kind of as you were, as you knew you could actually ship product? So we are actually are just starting now. Um, to do some press. Um, I've actually uh, brought on um, a publicist part-time uh, to help me do some of that outreach. Um, prior to launch, because we didn't have any product to ship, uh, we just didn't want um, to kind of burn, you know, any of those opportunities, um, you know, by getting people potentially excited and then not being able to deliver a product for them to try. And this is a product that you really can try because, you know, you can try it on morning breath, and then that morning breath is gone. You can try it after coffee breath. The coffee breath is gone. You can try it after, you know, a very tasty and flavorful meal. And then, you know, that that garlic or, you know, that onion uh, taste is gone. And so this, I think, is, and, and it, since it dissolves, it was really a product that I think you had to um, experience. Right. Uh, so right now, we are actually only starting to do that um, and are already getting uh, hits and requests uh, for samples. So hopefully you'll be seeing a lot more press um, in the near future. And, and what about kind of partnerships, whether they were distribution partnerships or brand partnerships, is that something as part of kind of the launch or now that you're working on? Yeah. Um, so I think partnerships uh, are really interesting, uh, interesting and important. I mean, in addition to, uh, what I, I think, uh, you know, alluded to, uh, a little while ago, which is I don't want to solely rely, um, on Facebook ads. 
uh, you know, for my inbounds, uh, but sampling, you know, has been uh, halted right now. Um, I'm looking at, you know, at brand partnerships, uh, you know, as a way um, to co-promote um, and just have access to a different audience uh, that, you know, we're not, you know, serving an ad to, um, you know, and that is uh, engaged uh, and interested uh, either in a similar mission um, or, uh, you know, or that other brand has uh, complementary um, characteristics. Um, and, you know, I think one of the challenges uh, that being a startup brand uh, has is that you don't have a lot to offer, you know, your, your I mean, other than product and, 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 and goodwill and ex the excitement of, you know, being this innovative new brand, but, you know, your email list is probably going to be smaller than uh, some of those brands that you're looking to partner with. Um, your following is probably also going to be a fraction of theirs. Um, so I found, you know, uh, I'm currently working actually on two partnerships. One is going to be um, a co-promotion, uh, kind of a sweepstakes types um, type event. And, um, and that just came from building the relationship with the founder um, and having a product that is quite complementary um, to theirs. Uh, they have another product in the oral care space. Um, but then, you know, to give you a second example, uh, I was also speaking to another company, another founder who, you know, is light years ahead of us, uh, you know, started out as ETC, you know, just launched um, in drug and, uh, you know, wanted to do something with them. And for them, you know, doing some kind of, you know, co-promotion just doesn't make as much sense just because of the size that we are. But so, you know, what they offered us instead, you know, was, you know, communication and shout outs on their social media. Um, and everybody who was subscribing within this one week, you know, would receive um, a free sample size of our product, you know, within um, their order. And of course, uh, similar to the dentist goodie bag, that'll come with a card, with a coupon attached, you know, and messaging about the product. Um, and so this is just, you know, another uh, other way, but, you know, we're, um, we're looking for opportunities, you know, and new ideas. So if anyone on this call um, has any, feel free to reach, reach out to me uh, afterwards. Um, great. Okay. Um, I want to get to audience questions, but I have at least, well, I have way more questions, but I have at least one more question I want to ask you before we get there. But for those of you who would like to ask a question, you could start putting them in the chat um, and we'll get to them in just a minute. So you did a lot in these last two years and into the launch. I think a lot of this audience struggles with when do you fundraise in this process, right? When do you fundraise, you know, a lot of times you'll talk to investors and they'll be like, you're too early. I want to see a launch, you know, um, how did you kind of, and I know you were also part of an accelerator program. So how did you think through those decisions and how did you sort of fund all of this um, kind of pre-launch, pre-revenue activity? Uh, great question. So we uh, raised money pre-launch because we had to. Uh, otherwise, we just couldn't have invested in the R&D and just couldn't have gotten to launch. So uh, I had to find a way, uh, you know, to, to get money um, to, to be able to move forward. So, you know, but, but if you can do it without, then like by all means, um, you know, wait until you have, you know, some of that early traction, um, you know, and, and I think that hopefully will make uh, your fundraising uh, a tiny bit easier, though it's hard, I think, no matter what. Um, it was really hard and, you know, uh, we heard, you know, what you said uh, a lot of times you're too early, you want to wait till launch. Uh, and that's really, uh, all about, you know, I, I think, you know, when, when you translate it from, you know, the brand's point of view, what that means to me is I want to wait, um, you know, and have you de-risk the business for me in terms of my investment. Um, and so, uh, I think that, you know, there are different types of investors, you know, we started out, um, with, uh, the innovation company that I was working with, you know, the, the head of that company was my first investor. And then I had, uh, an orthodontist, you know, who got the vision, who was, you know, my second angel and then, uh, ERA, which is the accelerator program that I did, um, you know, that also, uh, you know, gave us a nice, um, kind of cash influx to help continue. Um, so we've since raised, um, you know, a pre-seed round, uh, you know, which has enabled us now to launch, to invest, um, you know, in, in marketing, 
and supporting the brand, but but it was very difficult. And, and we heard uh, a lot of what you were mentioning in terms of being too early and had to find a way to either find investors who would be interested and take the risk early on, but also think about how do we de-risk this investment for them? And a lot of that market research, you know, uh, for us, it was really important not only to be solving a real problem, like I'd mentioned, um, uh, which is bad breath, but also making sure that we had a moat, you know, so we have a patent pending, we have an exclusive partnership, um, and also just show all of the work that we'd done um, and all of the signals that we'd gotten to give us the confidence that what we were going to be bringing to market uh, was actually, uh, you know, going to resonate uh, with an audience um, uh, of consumers uh, and that we had a formula, we had, you know, a manufacturing partner. Again, these were all kind of steps along the way of de-risking. And, um, and I think that as much as uh, a founder can think about it from the investor's point of view, um, you know, how do you de-risk it for me? Um, I think that helps you frame uh, that fundraising um, conversation, uh, hopefully in a way that uh, gets the investor uh, excited uh, about the opportunity versus thinking about, you know, all the things that could potentially go wrong. I asked a lot of founders this question, um, either in sessions like this or the podcast or whatever. And you're the only one, I mean, investors think about de-risking, right, all the time, but you're the only founder who's really kind of come back with that answer that you really thought about how to de-risk it for the investor. And I think that is such a great um, way to think, um, think about how investors think and have the right message to tell them because I do think, I mean, there are definitely investors who will not invest pre-seed or pre, sorry, pre-product or pre-revenue, but of those who do, so much of it is about, you know, what truly are the risks? How, what have you proved so far, right? And it sounds like a lot of your customer research was incredibly helpful in that. Yeah, no, uh, you know, thank you for saying that. Um, and also, you know, we had um, not only, you know, the, the research in terms of claims, brand, packaging, all of that, um, we had samples. Um, and then we also had all of the research that had been done uh, by our ingredient supplier on the ingredient. Um, that people could see um, in terms of efficacy. Um, and uh, we uh, encouraged our investors to, to do the garlic test, uh, you know, to really see that this product worked or do the morning after, you know, the morning breath test. Um, you know, so I think that also being able to, to show the product in action uh, also, you know, got them to see that one, you know, we've been able to formulate with this ingredient and two, that it worked um, and that you could actually notice uh, the difference. Um, but yeah, those were things that I thought about a lot. Um, I think just because, uh, you know, it is an uphill battle, um, you know, pre-launch. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, please put your questions in the chat. Um, Leslie asked, actually, if you could show the product, do you have it handy? I do. Here you go. This is mouth off. Um, it comes um, in a 10 piece uh, blister pack and you can buy it either as a one-time purchase uh, with two packs uh, on our website, mouthoff.com or as a subscription where um, you can save 25 to 50% depending on the pack number uh, that you order monthly. Did you, um, while I wait for questions to come into the chat, did you think about that? I mean, that packaging is gum packaging, right? Like it looks like a brand of uh, candy gum, normal gum. Um, did you consider that as you were thinking about maybe kind of future, if you were planning to go into drugstores, for example, or Target or Walmart or um, other retailers like that? Because that, that is sort of a pretty standard kind of packaging that people would know how to deal with. Yeah, um, so two main points to that. One, uh, Initially, we were limited. So we had a completely different vision of what our packaging was going to be as we were developing this brand. Uh, we wanted it to be um, in a resealable pouch, um, you know, with a higher um, count uh, inside. And um, we're limited initially just by what our uh, manufacturing partner could pack. And so that was, uh, you know, one of the, the elements, but we actually also tested a variety of different um, packaging formats uh, with consumers. 
And the blister pack was by far, like not just like a little bit, by far the preferred format as well. And so um, that also gave us confidence that while it wasn't, you know, what we initially had envisioned um, as our launch, we just needed to get something to market just to get started. Uh, and we could put uh, potentially in the future packaging innovation, you know, like a 2.0 uh, on the roadmap. But uh, if you're going to try to innovate on everything all at once, uh, you just might never get to market. Yeah, that's good advice. That's really good advice. Um, okay, we've got some questions in the chat uh, from Noel. Fellow Columbia and beauty industry alumna here. Thanks for doing this. What do you think about pre-launch wait lists for R&D heavy products? You know, I think you, you, it's so hard to say. I think it depends on the product. It depends, you know, on, on so many different factors. Uh, it depends on how long people are going to wait. Um, it depends on how exclusive, uh, how innovative uh, it is. Uh, you can always uh, try it, you know, and if you're not seeing results, just uh, either try different ways of getting people on the wait list or take it down. Um, you know, I think that if you think that there's, uh, a way to get this to work, you know, that will help you, um, you know, either create the buzz or help you tell the story as you uh, are looking to fundraise, um, you know, having a very uh, long and, and large and big uh, wait list uh, is definitely a point um, and a KPI that you can use uh, for investors. And if it's not working for you, then, um, you know, it just doesn't stay part of the story. But I think that it is than a data point uh, in terms of, you know, you figuring out why, uh, you know, it might not have worked um, because, you know, that can potentially help you either learn about communication, positioning, um, audience, you know, and a variety of other things. Great. Uh, from Jenna, for a product like yours, what do you find or would want the most, of hang on, I have I messed that up. Let me try again. For a product like yours, what do you find or would want the most effective channel for promotion or e-commerce fulfillment outside of website, SMS, email, or social? Are there other novel channels you're looking at for promoting this? Um, I, and I'm going to say, given that I do know Janak, I'm wondering if the things like Alexa, like, you know, voice and other kinds of, um, I'm wondering if that's where the direction he's going and kind of other channels to reach that consumer. Got it. So um, that is not on the immediate roadmap. We've just already had so many things to do just to get to market, to get the product ship, um, to start advertising. We've been in market a month and a half um, that this is potentially something that we will look at in the future, um, you know, if if and when the time is right. But right now we've just, you know, we have so many um, opportunities and things, you know, to be focusing and optimizing on. At this time, uh, you know, that those are the things, uh, you know, we're just working on. I mean, an example is we're about to, uh, you know, we launched reviews like a week and a half ago. You know, for us, that was, you know, an exciting component. We're about to um, hopefully relaunch next week uh, a free gift with purchase. Uh, this ended up having uh, an impact on our on our back end. It broke our back end. Uh, the first um, app that we plugged into our Shopify, so we had to turn it off and then are looking for another solution. And then in the near future, we're also um, planning on uh, launching a referral program. Uh, so these are the immediate things that we have on the roadmap. I think, you know, as we get more sophisticated, um, potent, you know, I think that's where the opportunity for kind of, you know, novel channels are, unless there's an opportunity that just presents itself that feels, you know, um, like a fit that makes sense uh, for the type of product. Uh, or channel that we're in. Uh, otherwise, I think we just don't have the bandwidth right now. Great. Um, from Mary, did you have any non-paid marketing tactics that you saw were effective for your launch? Uh, what we saw uh, that was effective uh, was, um, you know, I had been featured on some founder stories um, or some podcasts, and that generated a ton of interest. Um, and then also, you know, some of your first and early customers will be um, people in your network. So, you know, I posted about my launch uh, and about these articles uh, on LinkedIn, um, you know, and, and saw that that uh, did drive a lot of traffic. Um, and now, you know, this is when we're actually looking um, at these brand partnerships, uh, you know, that I was mentioning the, the, the two different ones and we'll continue 
uh, to look for others as well as the dental offices. Um, and uh, we will be looking uh, at influencers. Uh, just it's on the roadmap. Again, just haven't had the bandwidth yet. Um, I will mention also on um, just on your kind of press and podcasts and things like that, particularly, um, you know, if you're a woman founder, if you've got an interesting product, I've seen a lot of startups leverage that sort of either business press or being on podcasts or leveraging the founder story into sales. So it's not just consumer press that um, I think can be really helpful. So I'm glad yeah. You and, and I'll just say that, um, you know, we see that on Shopify, you know, when you see, um, you know, referring domains, uh, you know, we directly see, um, you know, when we have been featured, uh, you know, that go to the top as a referring domain. Yeah, that's great. Um, from Gavin, do you think that people chew gum for reasons beyond bad breath, such as they enjoy or find comfort in chewing gum? How does this play into gum that's gone in 60 seconds? And do people value gum based on how long it lasts? That is um, a great question and a question that I got from investors, you know, and so uh, what we did is we actually went um, and did the research. And uh, what we found was that the number one and two reason why people chew gum, with, which represents um, over two thirds um, of the um, occasion for gum chewing uh, is uh, either getting rid of bad breath or preventing bad breath. And so based on those need states, we felt that providing a gum that dissolves uh, was going to uh, solve for kind of the biggest need in the market. We're clearly not a product for somebody who just wants to chew something for a long time. Like we're, I mean, we, we're not in, but we know that. And we know that we can't be um, everything to everyone. And we're, we're, we're okay with that because, you know, we know that we're adding value to, you know, a significant group of people. We also see this as an opportunity to attract a mint consumer and a strip consumer or somebody who would not be currently chewing gum because they don't like the experience. Um, so, uh, we're not only thinking about providing a solution purely, uh, for the gum chewer, but, but yes, um, if you like having something in your mouth for extended periods of time, our product is definitely not for you. Uh, okay, the next question is from Priya. How and where did you find people to do your focus groups and market, play, ugh, and market research pre-launch? And what did the outreach look like? Online surveys, social polls, et cetera. Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, I actually used um, a company uh, and we were a beta tester, so we got really um, preferential pricing uh, on this. And uh, they've changed names, so I, I, you know, I mean, you know, reach out to me at info at mouthoff.com um, if you want to know who they are, and then you can look up what they who they've become because they I think they got bought. But um, and so and, and I know there are a lot of different companies, uh, you know, who offer uh, similar types of services. Uh, so for us, uh, I didn't want to have to be sourcing, um, you know, consumers myself, uh, but for the actual product sampling, you know, I was in an accelerator or, you know, in a co-working space and just recruited randoms, um, you know, to participate in that and made sure that, you know, all the feedback forms and everything was anonymous uh, so that, um, you know, could also get, um, you know, the, the feedback on the product itself as we were developing it. Great. Uh, the next question is from Umar. Can you talk about your experience with the food scientists? Where and how did you find them? And how did you approach the development process? Uh, so I found them through my network. Uh, I initially just sent, you know, I, I had Googled and found um, different individuals uh, who ended up not being uh, the right fit um, because they didn't have uh, either they were, you know, they had their own process. And so you could just white label um, what they were making, but they wouldn't be able to develop something uh, for you from scratch. Uh, so I reached out uh, to all of the founders and the various communities that I knew and asked uh, if anybody knew anyone. And then um, it's literally, you know, the, the treasure hunt or the yellow brick road. You just go down that journey and you speak to somebody uh, and then they tell you, oh, I know somebody else you could speak to. I'm not the right person. Then you go you know, speak to that person. And so um, it took uh, multiple months 
uh, of finding people because you know you need uh, individuals with uh, the right equipment as well. Uh, until I found uh, a team of people who uh, I was happy with and uh, and engaged. Um, I think one of the big learnings, you know, if if I may share, is that um, I developed. Oh, and so uh, based on my prior um, CPG food experience, um, you know, I had learned how to write briefs and, and, and things like that. And so, you know, the way that you start once you find uh, the, the people you want to work with is you write a brief, you know, of what the product is, uh, what the product is not, what it should have in it, what it shouldn't, and then like must haves and then nice to haves. Um, and then, uh, of course, one of my requirements was that, um, you know, it would be a formula that then, um, you know, would be able to be commercialized and scaled. Uh, and uh, I think that, you know, one of the, the big learnings was, um, you know, I don't know how I could have done that at, the, at that point, but I, now that I know what I know, I would have tried to at least think about it, was finding uh, a manufacturing partner prior to the formula being completed so that um, the manufacturer and the formulators could work in tandem or collaboratively to find some you know, to make it, to make something that would be able to then transition easily um, into a scalable product. Uh, you know, for me, that ended up being a difficult journey, finding somebody who could make it. So if there's any way you could, again, de-risk or find <laughs> some way to make sure that, um, you know, you, you don't have um, that challenge earlier on, you know, I think just makes everything align more nicely, if possible. Sometimes it just isn't, but yeah, that, that's really good advice. I've actually heard that um, a lot in the beauty space as well, is that you kind of want your, the people who are helping you formulate your products to be very in very close contact to manufacturers. Yeah. Um, okay, um, from Leslie. Leslie has an idea for you. Part, you should partner with dating sites for when you meet face-to-face. -face. I love it. I love it. And I think that um, that's going to just be so relevant you know, as people uh, get more comfortable with hopefully, you know, the new normal um, in, in, in the future. Uh, so I think that's a great idea. Um, and it's definitely something that, um, that we're considering, um, not only in terms of a potential partnership, but also in terms of an audience, um, we're going to test targeting um, on, uh, on our social media platforms. Great. Uh, the next question is from Bo. Thank you so much. Really great to hear the story. Okay. In terms of going D to C versus wholesale, how did you decide to go D to C instead of working with chain retailers? Or is that something you've planned down the road? Does this impact your unit economics? And was that a consideration going into D to C? Uh, great question. Uh, so I believe that mouth off, uh, the potential for mouth off is omnichannel. Uh, so we are planning um, on introducing uh, this brand and product uh, outside of direct to consumer, uh, but not until year two, most likely. Um, I think that, you know, a couple of things. First of all, uh, the more channels you add, the more money you need, um, because each requires its own budget for you to support it and for you to be successful at. Um, and so we um, had limited budget and so wanted to make sure that we understood the costs of the channels and pick the one where we could excel and be the most successful in at the beginning to be able to continue to grow and tell that story. Um, secondly, uh, launching uh, online, um, you know, is more immediate than launching in traditional brick and mortar. Uh, so, you know, you can turn on your website and then start shipping, you know, next day. Uh, getting into retail uh, takes a long time. Um, and actually having uh, a successful online sales story uh, can help you um, get into retail. And so this is something that we're really um, conscious of and thoughtful of um, in terms of knowing that these are data points that will help us um, get uh, into traditional retail. Um, and just, yeah, and lead times, you know, uh, category reviews, you know, for, you know, for, you know, for the, for the, for the stores, um, you know, happen once, maybe twice a year. So to even get planogrammed, um, you know, could be a 12 to 18 month process, um, especially if you need to get into a distributor, uh, you know, if, if that retailer only purchases via distributor, 
um, you know, plus uh, when you go into retail, you don't know who your consumer is. So you're making a huge investment. A lot of times you have to do free fill. Um, you have to, um, I, or pay slotting and or both. Um, and then you have to promote um, and do, you know, a lot of support um, to make sure that the product is selling and turning on shelf. Um, because if you don't hit certain velocities, um, you will be discoed. And uh as we thought about it, it seemed to make more sense to invest our dollars um, into being able to bring the consumer to our site, know who they are, um, you know, really own uh, that relationship um, between our end consumer um, and the brand, and really make sure that um, you know we uh, could you know build that strong story and those strong advocates early on, um, you know, and 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 only then um, you know think about retail. But I come from, you know, a lot of retail and I've done a lot of it. And so these are, are lessons I learned, you know, the hard way. Uh, and, uh, you know, but, uh, and, but in terms of also unit economics, which I think was an, uh, another um, issue, clearly margins um, are better direct to consumer um, because you don't have to split them with the retailer and or distributor, um, you know, but uh, when you go into retail, you know, just your your opportunity um, to scale, you know, hits a completely different level. Um, we are going to need to fundraise again before we go into retail. Yeah, thank you for that. That was really helpful. And for everybody who was interested in that response, three weeks ago, we did a retail X session called Building Wholesale Relationships. Um, that is on the Retail X YouTube channel. So if you want to hear more about a brand who actually did it and the pros and cons of doing it and what happened to margins and pricing and all that kind of stuff, uh, check it out on the Retail X YouTube channel. That was my little plug. Um, okay, we are out of time. Thank you everyone for your questions. Camille, thank you so much for coming on. This was great. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to tell the mouth off story, to tell you about you know myself. Uh, hopefully you will all try it. I'll become customers um, and uh, good luck to all the founders, you know, best of luck, um, you know, on your own journeys as well. Thanks. And thanks everyone. Um, like I mentioned, you'll be added to the RetailX email list and the Slack channel, or you get an invite to the Slack channel. So I hope you accept both and I hope to see you in April at the next RetailX sessions. Thank you.